Hello, everybody. Thank you for joining us today. Uh, we're now going to go on to the cybersecurity panel. Uh, so, you know, a group of experts talking about what we don't allow. Uh, but in general, I <laughs> want to kind of let everyone introduce themselves, talk about their roles, and then we'll kind of jump into some questions. So, John, you want to start us off? Sure. Thanks, Scott. Uh, hi, everyone. John Johnston. I'm director of cybersecurity operations for United States Steel here in Pittsburgh. Um, I'm a part of cybersecurity. There's the compliance side, the rules and policies, and I'm on the operations side. Hi guys, Michael Yoho from uh, CNX Resources. We are a net negative uh, carbon uh, producer of natural gas. Uh, I manage our operational technology footprint, especially in the upstream midstream space. Uh, I allow more things than I deny, for the record, <laughs> and uh, I wear a hat of cybersecurity. I'm Jeff Whaler. I'm Senior Vice President for Keystone Clearwater Solutions. We're a water and waste management vendor or supplier for the uh, predominantly for the gas industry in Pennsylvania, Ohio, and West Virginia, where we manage and pump and store and handle water and, and wastewater, uh, both for natural gas customers and for industrial customers throughout the region. Um, my responsibility uh, covers <laughs> a lot of territory for the company. I'm, I've overseen our automation investment and, and planning together with, you know, we've partnered with Gray Matter over the past seven years and um, you know also responsible for a number of different facets of our business. Great. Thank you everybody. I appreciate you all coming today and uh, we'll go ahead and get started off with the first question kind of we'll throw this one at you John first and yeah. how are you thinking about cybersecurity and remote connectivity in your company specifically over the last couple of years how it's changed and what you allow? Yeah that's a good question. I think it was a question that came up earlier uh, today as well. So. Um, it, obviously, today remote connectivity is important, right? I mean, in the past few years, we've seen it. Uh, uh, if you if you weren't ready for it, uh, you had to get ready fast. Um, and for some folks, that was a struggle. Um, other companies were prepared for that. Uh, I, I think. Uh, seeing that the workforce, uh, uh, you can be productive and successful working remotely, I think has changed a lot of uh, views from, you know, management, HR, those kind of folks who thought everyone had to be, you know, behind the door and in the, in the uh, cubicles and offices. So I think working remotely is, is um, from a security perspective, obviously a risk, right? So um, we, we, you know, like many companies, follow best practices to make sure there's, you know, strong user authentication user IDs, passwords, multi-factor, to make sure that that person on the other end of that computer is who they say they are, and they get access to only what they should get access to. Jeff, uh, your thoughts on remote connectivity? Yeah, it's certainly important to us. Uh, our business is extremely remote. We operate uh, predominantly out of pickup trucks throughout uh, the rural areas of, of the Appalachian Basin in Pennsylvania, Ohio, and West Virginia. So. Really, from day one, remote connectivity has been, uh, you know, a critical factor to to how we operate our business, and it's become, you know, even more so important, you know, over the past several years as as we've converted our workforce uh, really to deploying automation throughout throughout our operations. So, you know, not only having remote connectivity um, in of our people, but uh, really beginning to drive the the remote connectivity of our assets in very challenging operating environments. So we've had, you know, we've had to bring in, you know, various <laughs> technologies to be able to connect to our equipment because of the locations of it. Mm -hmm. So, you know, we've, we've made a considerable investment, you know, over the past six, seven years, um, really to get to where we are today and be able to leverage those technologies, um, you know, to, to mm -hmm. deliver best in class solutions to our customers. Great. So, uh, Michael, over the last six months, there's been a number of, I'll say, OT attacks or attacks against production environments. How have you changed your philosophy, or has this adopted some of the way you guys approach cybersecurity in the OT space? It's crazy. It's been a it's been a really crazy time. Like our roadmap hasn't changed because we feel very confident in the direction we're heading. But you always have to look around and, and be situationally aware of what's going on and then maybe tailor some of those solutions or strengthen your posture in the areas where the attacks most occur. Remote connectivity, to transfer back to question number one, is huge. So 
we have uh, bolstered our end user training. So we consider that the first line of defense. They are the human firewall. Yes, I will trademark that. Um, <laughs> After the human firewall, we, we take a look at our, our industry practices. We look at, uh, do a lot of questioning of our internal resources. I think if you look at a, a lot of things have been converged because of value ITOT wise. So you'll probably see some decoupling of some of those things. Um, I think what happened with the colonial pipeline, there's either rumors or articles that that actually um, affected a pay system which was on the IT network but maybe had some purview into the OT network. So you start to rethink the systems into your, in your enterprise and you start to look a little bit more holistically like what should be, what framework can we transfer from the OT world into the IT world? How can we, what really should be part of our disaster recovery or cyber attack program or incident response program. Not that those things weren't, but it heightens the awareness of it. Mm -hmm. So I think you start to question systems. You start to then transfer the knowledge of the OT and our cybersecurity world into maybe the IT environment a little bit more. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think that's a, a, a very important point there is the interconnectivity between mm -hmm. IT and OT is probably the highest it's ever been. And that interconnectivity, Colonial is a perfect example. Uh, an impact that hits IT could potentially impact OT, Correct. even if it's not an OT specific attack. Yeah, for sure. And, and I think that some of the philosophy changes we're seeing are, John, are you seeing some of those as well? Oh, absolutely. So um, in, in our industry, one of our major projects is, you know, following best practice and segmenting our networks, right? Mm -hmm. uh, isolating those production machines away from the IT world, making that more secure there, uh, which then creates other challenges because you need to pass data back and forth, mm -hmm. uh, you know, to get uh, analytics and statistics and things like that. Um, so you have to create a, a secure way for that to happen as well. So, and that gives the bad guy a way in, so you gotta be careful on how you do that. So not every project, um, you know, you just wanna open things up and let data flow, you gotta be careful how you do that and wrap the right layers of security around that. And Jeff, uh, has this changed any of your philosophies uh, as you guys operate as far as the uptick in attacks and kind of how big a target we've become over the last year? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, we certainly, you know, we're what I describe a middle market company as, a, you know, we're typically a, a service provider to larger entities. And we certainly, I think, like was said earlier, we certainly don't want to be uh, responsible for any reputational risk of our customers. So. You know, I think it's it's really driven our, our thought process around making sure that you know we have the appropriate investment uh, to protect our assets at each each of these locations. And like I said earlier, you know we are we're utilizing several different types of communication strategies. So there's vulnerabilities that we need to be thinking about, you know, across a, a wide array you know of platforms. So you know I think that's why we've we've used some of the technologies mm -hmm. we have to to make sure we have that that protection at each location. Yeah, and I, I think one of the things you guys have done that's a, a, from an adaption standpoint is you adopted kind of a zero trust model for things on your network, regardless of technology, this concept that for something to communicate on your network, it needs to be give prescribed permission rather than implied because I'm on your network, I get to talk to other things. Uh, has that assisted kind of as you guys have kind of gone to more remote and more connectivity out in kind of rare rural places? Yeah, absolutely. I'm thinking you know, having that segmentation amongst our assets and having encryption kind of locally at e each asset has, has really, you know, given us the comfort level that, that we're pretty well protected on that mm -hmm. end, you yeah. know. And I think everybody kind of has a, a, a challenge around uh, segmentation and uh, I think pretty much everybody probably has a different philosophy and I'd love to hear y'all's thoughts on that. So I'll start with you, John. Uh, the value of segmentation, how far do you go down? How granular <coughs> do you get? Uh, what controls you put in place? Or is, is there guidance that you guys look to for your segmentation? Mm. Uh, yeah, so uh, <laughs> the, the deeper you go, the more complex it gets, right? Mm -hmm. So, um, <clears throat> and um, fortunately or unfortunately, we, we go pretty deep. So we have our segmentation all the way down to the units. And so being able to build the, the security around that, um, one, involves not only IT folks, but may, more so the OT folks, right? It's their world. We need to understand what needs to talk and what doesn't. So we work closely with them, a uh, number of projects to, to have, you know, continuous conversations with them about the traffic that's going through, what should, what shouldn't. And then, you know, again, following those best practices to make sure that, um, you know, we don't block the good traffic, we, we only block the bad traffic. Yeah, and it's a different kind of challenge for you, for you though, Michael, when you look at how 
distributed your network is, specifically when you look at midstream environments, right? I don't right. have a site. I can just kind of keep a perimeter around that. So how do you approach kind of segmentation and separative responsibilities? So for us, it's about really, we understand that there will be a cyber attack on our company at some point. We approach it that way. So we scenario play and we really rank things to reduce our blast radius, natural gas company pun intended, <laughs> and ensure that, you know, that we can really isolate things and get down to uh, a very secure level uh, and really take uh, and deliver safety to our, our shareholders, because that's what this is about as well. Uh, we're a publicly traded company and we want to protect them and their interest. You have to make it part of your culture and you have to make it part of your design process as the technology within the midstream or upstream or any type of vertical progresses. It has to be a constant evolving part of your thought process. That's great, and kind of leads me to my next, uh, and I'll throw this one at you, Jeff. Uh, how do you get leadership engaged? So whether it be the board, whether it be your shareholders, your stakeholders, how do, you, how do you get them engaged with whatever you're doing from a cybersecurity standpoint? For us, for us, it really helps that, you know, that our customers are driving the, the requirements, you know, oftentimes. I mean, we, you know, we've, we've been fortunate to have affiliations with some, some larger entities, larger corporates that, that are kind of more progressive in this front. And then our customers are really leading some change, um, you know, in this area. But, you know, I think in terms of, we've always had a model where we want to be kind of at the forefront in terms of technology um, you know, and be leaders there. So, you know, I don't think it, it has been a difficult sell to, to make sure that, you know, we're making the appropriate mm -hmm. investment to be protected. Yeah, and have you done anything special, Michael, when you, when you want to get your board or your leadership? Uh, yeah, I think it starts up front. I think it, you know, you can look at it two ways. We do both bottom up and top down approaches. So our security team reports to a CXO, which in turn reports to our CEO. So that is two levels up, you know, not very, far away. So I think they both understand the value and they've been pressing and pushing us. Uh, so that's very much top down. And then we, we look at the people that we have in the field, some very talented people who have pushed and created a really strong cybersecurity framework. And we start to push and evolve and become creative and try to, try to stay ahead of both the technology development and the uh, cybersecurity or uh, bad actor element, right? Because they're getting ahead of us as we sit here on this very stage. Mm -hmm. um, so it's about that and letting them understand what our resources are. And I think that's something that we all wear many hats in our day-to-day -day jobs and very few of us are, are able to spend 100% of our times on cybersecurity itself. So it's like being able to, for them to understand that, hey, we need resources to monitor this and to do this and help configure this. You know, I am not a cybersecurity expert. I don't hold a degree. However, I understand the business value, the application, and, and how things work enough that I understand and, and able to create roadmaps and have vision about that. But resources and getting people to understand both the value of the technology to uh, keep people out or detect when people are inside, that's really important. And as you guys look at each of your industries and you try to understand the new technologies, right? Because yeah. I think that's one of the, the biggest challenges when we look at cybersecurity is everyone's got the newest mousetrap. Right. Uh, how do you kind of sift through the noise as you guys look at your different industries and how do you approach new technologies? And I think I'll start with you first, John. And just when you think about the new technologies, what are the ones that kind of seem to float above the rest? Yeah, I think probably like everyone in here, I get tons of phone calls every day from a vendor trying to sell the new shiny object, right? And so you're, you're right, you have to weed through that. I think working with uh, other folks in our field to, to kind of see what works for them, uh, working with partners like uh, Gray Matter is, is critical to helping us understand what, what's real and what's not, what works, what doesn't, um, and, and bringing that value to back to the business, right? We're going to spend the money on it. How do we get some value out of that fairly quickly? So I think, um, again, word of mouth, working with other professionals, and then, and then partners help, help kind of weed through that. How about you, Michael? How do you, because you've, you've kind of got a little bit different in your vertical, the way you guys approach technology, so I'd love to hear your, your thoughts on how you guys select technology. Sure. We have, um, I personally, in, in our philosophy, is we have three filters. Is it good technology? Is it good technology for the oil and gas industry? Is it good technology for my particular enterprise? And I think that each filter has so many things, 
you know, you can weed things and people and platforms out easily if you put it through those filters. Um, you know, the bottom level is very fine. You know, I am in the craft cocktail world scene, and so filtering out all those unwanted things out of my drinks, so which just a nice cocktail, is something that I'm after, something clean and pure, and I think that translates to, to the filters that are in place for us. Then we look on the return on investment. Like, we are a, a, a cash flow positive company. We are a uh, environmental steward. We look to, for technology to not only provide support for one initiative, but a lot of our initiatives, and we're very stringent about what we bring in-house. Jeff, same question. Yeah, we're constantly looking at new technologies because, you know, really, because of the challenges I described earlier. I mean, around communication, we're looking at new technologies and, and communication strategies that we can use as a failover because of, you know, the need to be you know, have 100% uptime. And, um, you know, we're also looking at different technologies, you know, throughout our organization because of just the dynamic nature of the business. Our, our operation isn't like a plant. It's not like a factory where you can set it and forget it to some extent. We're setting up a, a plant or a factory at, at every site we go to. And, um, and, and we, have, we have a variety of customers that are driving a lot of this, um, you know, we, you know, CNX is, is a, customer, a customer of ours, and, you know, we have a number of other customers uh, that we work for, and everyone has unique preferences, and it, it drives a lot of the requirements for each job we set up, and it's causing us to think about the technologies we're deploying um, on every job site, and we need to select technologies that allow us to have that dynamic setup. Um, so, I mean, we're in the process of, of changing our SCADA platform, you know, as one example right now, to give us the ability to have a dynamic setup every time we set up mm -hmm. a job. I think you have to look at the I think you have to look at the risk, maybe the, the negative risk everyone looks at first, but there's positive risks. What if we don't implement this technology now? Like and I don't think enough people spend enough time looking at that and looking at the horizons and even we even create our own gardener our technology hype cycle gardener puts out. Do you guys know what I'm talking about digitally and uh, <laughs> you know the the what's on the rise, what's maybe people are like, oh, that's a lot of work, and then there's the, what is it? that's the trough of dis disillusionment, and then they have the uh, peak of the uh, inflated whatever, mm -hmm. but like, do that for yourselves, and also do that for um, your cybersecurity software or your cybersecurity program, or your people, what has worked, what has not worked, so I think that when you evaluate technology, let's not forget about the people and the risk, both positive and negative. Yeah, and I think it's uh, something a lot of times we talk about. We, we focus a lot on the technology, uh, but I think uh, to you know, steal off your trademark, the, the people firewall, or the, you know, the, the, the human, firewall. human firewall concept, uh, we, we con constantly overlook you know, people, process, and technology. We go straight to the technology. Yeah. Uh, as you guys kind of approach that, what are you doing with your employees? What are you doing with you know, the stakeholders, the people who are involved, the people who are uh, the first line of defense would be the best way to put it? Yeah. Uh, how are you guys getting them engaged in cybersecurity? When I look at a, a controls engineer, and I, you know, his his mo main focus, right, is getting product through the line, right, or yeah. focusing on that one piece. How do I get security onto his roadmap? So, so we um, perform various tests to which we advertise which department had failures at those tests. So you could call that passively shaming those <laughs> departments or actively shaming, if you will. We don't actually name names, but we look at departments. Um, and that was very motivational for a lot of people. It's very eye-opening that, wow, in this department, which uh, we had this many failures of this certain type of test from a cybersecurity perspective. And I think like that type of enablement or awareness now raises the department or the employee's uh, cybersecurity awareness. Mm -hmm. You know, I think that um, that's important. I think giving them real world examples in, in value and why or uh, taking them through actual events and things that have actually happened, educating the human firewall to be more stringent on what they do, how they do things or how they design things or, oh, this involves the cloud. I need to get the cybersecurity team involved because data is now going off of our properly, property. Let's make sure we do this in a secure manner. John, same question. Uh, how do you get people engaged in cyber? 
Yeah, so it, it, uh, it starts from the top, right? So we're very fortunate that our CEO will put out a message um, periodically uh, about cybersecurity, especially, you know, October Cybersecurity Month. Mm -hmm. So um, we're real heavy on communicating. Uh, throughout the year, we do um, education um, um, clips that go out to, to users, anyone who has a user account. So if you're on the plant floor, you have a user account, or you're sitting in an office, you, you get that uh, communication. We do phishing tests as well. So, you know, you, we send out the message, look for this, you know, next time you get a fish, we test you. If you fail it, you have to go to the train, you know, get some training, that sort of thing. We also, um, from a management level, uh, at our plants, we use scorecards, and so each each plant has a scorecard, and that gets a little bit, you know, as you mentioned, uh, shamey a little bit. They, it gets com <laughs> it gets competitive, right? So yeah. this plant manager doesn't want to uh, be low on the totem pole, so they're working hard to to um, you know to get their scores up. You know, scores are things like patching, and are their employees passing? You know, uh, educational testing uh, out of. Uh, support systems, those kind of things. We we score that, and and that gives some emphasis on you know uh, the IT folks there, or uh, some some places the OT folks helping to get those machines and and those things patched. So I mentioned earlier, we're also um, hiring cybersecurity specialists to go into the plant, who will be that kind of liaison to help the plant uh, prioritize what needs to be done, so they can focus on uh, making product. And we can help them focus, you know, take some of that focus on uh, security and, and um, you know, make it a little easier for them. Mm -hmm. And so when you, when you look at kind of engaging people, uh, the, there's a fundamental lack of resources when it comes to OT specific cybersecurity. It's, it's just, it's industry wide, it's also every organization, there's always been a lack. How do you overcome that, that lack of resources that a lot of people are struggling with? And I'll, I'll start with you, Jeff, first on this one. Well, I mean, I think you have to just stay after it. I mean, for one thing, I mean, for us, for us, we have we have a wide range of technological aptitude or savvy throughout the organization. So, you know, I think for us, we've we've kind of had to focus on on education and making sure you have programs and making sure you're managing those programs consistently and and you've made a commitment to them to be a recurring part of your culture and your organization. Mm -hmm. So, you know, I think for us, it's it's been kind of staying on top, making that commitment, and, and seeing through your programs, you know, over the course of time to make sure that you're, mm -hmm. you're culturally bought in as an organization. And it, it's, been a, it's been a learning curve, mm -hmm. for sure, and yeah. transitioning because of, because of the reasons I described. Yeah, absolutely. Michael, how do you kind of overcome that, that talent shortage? You know, a lot of times you get a cybersecurity uh, evaluation with this giant punch list from maybe a consulting firm with a lot of capital letters in their name. There's like 50 of them around, you know, but what does that really mean to your enterprise? Like what value is that? So you have to rely on domain knowledge and you have to pick those unicorns that we call them that maybe have IT, OT or cybersecurity uh, understanding. Uh, you have to enable them. Uh, you cannot overload them um, because they're still generating value for the company. Um, they're still, you know, your application um, administrators, they're still your data stewards, but they know they transverse the, it's like, you know, um, stranger things, you have the underworld and then the regular world, and so like, you know, here's their day job and they venture over into the under, what's it called, the underground? Uh, the underworld, yeah, what was it yeah. called? Upside the upside down. 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 There he gets a prize. There make sure he gets a prize. <laughs> um, and so they venture into the upside down, which is uh, cybersecurity for them, where they may not know everything. And I, I don't repair the air conditioning in my house because I don't know a lot about that. So I engage business partners to make sure that have a better understanding that can set me up with the framework so when I bring it back into a house, I can in turn manage it. Because at CNX, we're very much doers. We like to know and we like to do ourselves. But that doesn't mean I don't need that subject matter expert to tell me how to configure things. Here are the pitfalls. You know, here's something to jumpstart the, the time to realized value from your cybersecurity investments. You really have to kind of blend those things together so the underworld gets a lot lighter, you know, or the upside down becomes right side up. And when we look at kind of where the industry is going, I think there's a, a fear of you know, federal regulation coming from almost every vertical, every everyone from every aspect. How do you guys approach what might be coming uh, versus also what's already here for some of you? For example, uh, the recent executive order, the you know the TSA rules. Uh, 
how do you guys kind of approach both kind of compliance but also kind of achieving security with kind of the big unknown with when it comes to what might be from a regulation standpoint? And John, I'll throw you under the bus on that one first. Yeah, so. yeah, thank you. <laughs> Appreciate that. Uh, yeah, I think from, from steel industry, there's, there's not a whole lot of regulation, but some areas we do government work, so there's mm -hmm. regulation, right? So um, basically following best practices. We, we, we look at some standards and we want to we want to be at that you know high bar and we follow that whether we're you know regulated at that, that site or not we want we want to be the same across all of our sites. Mm -hmm. So I think rolling out that best practice you know following this model um, is, is it works best for us right now uh, mm -hmm. until you know somebody comes in and says you have to do more. Mm -hmm. um, but I think you know the, the standard we are based on some assessments we've had, uh, we can we can hit the mark when they do show up at the doors. Yeah, and I and I, I think, Michael, you know, fortunately or unfortunately, you are in the current regulation target. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah. So how are you guys approaching kind of a compliance standpoint? You, you know, this is kind of like a no sweat kind of thing for us, <laughs> because we like to be extra, extra, extra. We're not basic at all. So whether it be cost or human employee safety. Uh, we always try to do more than what's expected of us environmentally. Like I mentioned, we're, you know, we've, we're currently carbon negative, net carbon negative. So we try to be extra. And so from a cybersecurity perspective, we try to do more than what's asked of us. So instead of waiting somebody for, to come and attack us, we, you know, we raise our situational awareness on those type of things. You know, we live outside of the NIST 5, so you could call it the CNX 10, if you will, <laughs> of things that we actually keep us up at night. So, so we try to be extra when it comes to things and be more proactive than reactive about it because we understand how the, the framework of uh, bad actors is evolving to a point, like, like I said, we assume we're gonna be attacked. I mean, in today's day and age, your company is gonna, needs to assume it's mm -hmm. gonna be attacked at some point. Um, and if there's any doubters out there, let's <laughs> have a cocktail and talk about that a little bit. Um, and you're not truly air-gapped. Um, those are the same people. <laughs> they live in the same building. Um, so I think from that perspective, we try to be extra and stay ahead of the curve. Um, what that means, you know, uh, technology, people, people training, uh, strong business partners that understand our business verticals outside of those big consulting firms, you can go on and on and on. Yeah, yeah and, and, you, and you mentioned the NIST 5, and I think that's a great starting point for a lot of people, just understanding those kind of five function areas. Uh, when you look at those, and, I, and I'll kind of throw this one at you first, Jeff, when we look at the identify, detect, protect, respond, and recover, when we look at those kind of five function areas, what are the areas you think uh, most people are strong at, and what are the areas you think, I think kind of universally are the weakest? And I'll start with you, Jeff, on this one. Yeah, I mean, I think from my perspective, and I, you know, I think I operate in a slightly different world. Yeah. Um, you know, being a, a smaller entity, I mean, I think, you know, we're we're probably best at um, having some level of protection, having some level of monitoring. Mm -hmm. You know, employing so, patches, yeah. using two factor two factor authentication mm -hmm. throughout the organization, using devices on our endpoints. Um, you know, I think doing the basic blocking and tackling, right? Mm -hmm. um, you know, I think from com for companies our size, you know, I'm aware of, you know, that we are being attacked. It's not, are you going to be attacked? We are being attacked and we're seeing that regularly. Yeah. You know, you're seeing phishing attempts and, uh, you know, failed ones or, you know, and we've been through sev several of them, none, none serious, but, um, you know, I think so we, we need to be aware of that on an ongoing basis. Um, you know, but I think you know we 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 also have been through several cybersecurity assessments with with consultants and mm -hmm. you know both internally and externally, mm -hmm. and so we we also have those those checklists. Um, and for us, it's a matter of using good judgment. I mean, we need to kind of prioritize those items that are important for us. Um, you know, and and kind of be be aware of it all yeah. the time. I mean, be on top of it all the time. But you know, I think. You know, like Michael said, we also have, uh, you know, we don't have all day to, every day to, to focus on it. So, you know, it just needs to be part of our cadence on, on a regular recurring basis. Yeah, yeah, it's like the framework needs to get down to a point where you're getting notified, not that you're actively monitoring, right? You're, something's up, yep. here's what we think it is, here's where it was, 
check it out, you know. And I think that's what we're seeing. We're seeing a, a lot more maturity when it comes to kind of moving towards that proactive approach to security, yeah. uh, a lot less reactive, right? Because I think you, you, you really nailed it, when you, both you and Jeff, when you talked about it's not a matter of if, it's a when question now. Uh, and so you start to look more proactively. What are some of the things you guys do uh, or you recommend for people to do from a proactive approach to cybersecurity? So I'll, I'll start with you, Michael. You know, I think that things like honeypots or deception technology is important. I personally believe there's a, a lot of value in raising situational awareness there. Um, you know, I, I think being a little bit more boutique or strategic about the value placement of things is important. Uh, I think right now extending your cybersecurity frameworks to other things within your enterprise is probably very appropriate and uh, you know, certainly pertains to this. Mm -hmm. um, and 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 you, John, when you look at you look at kind of the way you approach a lot of these areas, uh, how do you guys kind of manage? And I've, what I typically see to be the most lacked two areas, which is respond and recovery. Mm -hmm. uh, how do you guys kind of manage the way you approach those? And I'll start with you, John, and then I think Michael's got. <laughs> Yeah, earlier when you, when you asked that question, I was thinking re respond and recovery is probably yeah. the, the, the biggest lack of uh, um, initiative um, I've seen it at, in many places. Um, I, I think um, focusing on, part of that recovery is focusing on the front end, identifying. A lot, a lot of people don't even know what assets they have out there, right? So making sure you understand what you have uh, to be able to protect and then recover when, you know, and respond to when there's an issue, uh, I think is key. And, and then, you know, response plans, I think, are lacking. I think people don't spend enough time pulling the right people together to be able to respond to something. You know, a couple IT folks know how I got to go get a backup and try to recover, mm -hmm. but, but what's the business going to do? How are they going to respond? How are mm -hmm. they going to react to it? How do they communicate out to folks that we have a problem, we need to, you yeah. know, uh, delay for, you know, a period of time until we back up? Yeah, yeah and I think that's, when you look at your industry, mm -hmm. that that's extremely important to have kind of a, what's our response plan? Because I can't just, throw a switch and turn a furnace off, right? That's, right. I, mean, yeah. I mean, it's a multi-million dollar asset that if it doesn't go through the right down procedure, you cause major damage. Yeah. And uh, I think one of the things I would always recommend yeah. and have a conversation with you is, is our, is our response plan well communicated? I think that's what a lot of times when we look at struggles is people don't know what to do, right? Yeah. Oh, we're getting hit. Everyone knew we, we assume that the, the win, right? You get hit and I don't know what to do. Who do I call? What is my first steps? I thought that's IT my, was taking care of that. Yeah, yeah, what's <laughs> my process, right? It's, yeah. That's IT's problem, that's not my, well, yeah. except for when it's an operational issue, right? Mm, it's, right? This is an unplanned downtime event. And when I look at it from that perspective, a lot of times I want to attach cybersecurity to the same way we do maintenance, mm. right? Unplanned downtime, it's, mm, it's, it's the bane of our existence. What are the steps you would like to take to kind of promote that within organizations? So. So the first thing is, let's go back to the NIST 5 for a second. So a lot of people, I believe, they worry so much about the outer shell of the organization that they forget about the inner shell. So it's like a candy bar, very crunchy exterior, but soft and gooey inside. Um, so that's something that you want to make, change your posture on and, and have that rigidity inside. And, and like we've talked about, the last two of the NIST 5, the kind of, you know, the respond and, and then the kind of desk. We actually, I think of it more as disaster recovery because that's what it is. Mm -hmm. You know, it's not a cybersecurity attack that should be attached to your disaster recovery plans. We have all sorts of operational, I don't know if you guys do too, operational events where what if you know, event X happens. Ready, here's the scenario, go. And we get everybody in a room and we plan yep. for those things. Do you also do that from a cybersecurity perspective? You know, I know you probably have disaster recovery events where you fail back servers and stuff, but what if you discover those backups are tainted, if you will? Mm -hmm. uh, you know, like, that's the kind of stuff I think we need to start moving into and maybe marrying that with the business because <clears throat> if there's a if there's an event your business change what are the business processes that need to change how do we deploy people in the field where the resources go it's a big deal and i think people just look at it as oh i have a vmware snapshot from yesterday i'm just going to bring that back up well guess what they've been in your system for four months <laughs> do you have what's the average time do you feel a bad actor is going to be in your system and do you have backups past that like mm -hmm. those type of scenario roles and that kind of data and thought process i think need to happen 
and yeah. they're not. Yeah, I think we, we focus way too often on just backing up the data and not backing up the process, right? Not understanding, like I, I constantly talk about you've got data backups, but what happens if your ladder logic's all wiped out, right? What if you lose all your version, all your configuration data, right? That, that, that stuff that's critical to the process, great, you got your data back, yeah. but now you have no way to, of you know, doing anything with it, right? Yep. Uh, when we look at kind of a lot of those kind of things, uh, when you guys approach it, and I think we kind of all alluded to assessments of some shape or form, how do you guys approach assessments as a philosophy and as a kind of how do you prep for one? Uh, and I'll, I'll start with you first, Jeff. You know, in terms of our assessments, mm -hmm. I, mean, I think we, we just want to make sure we're doing them on a regular basis and partnering with the right companies <laughs> to perform them. I mean, I think this, for us, it's, that's, that's a process that we, we tend to, to outsource and we make sure we partner ourselves with companies that, that know what they're doing and are, are the experts. I mean, we are not, we are not the experts. Yeah. Um, and I think we would be the first ones to admit that. And that, you know, I think that's something that makes me feel comfortable about it, knowing that we were, we're bringing the right partners in to, to perform the assessments and make sure that we are accomplishing the blocking and tackling that's recommended, that's industry standard, that's, that's, that's kind of meeting the demands of, of, of the operations. And uh, I'll go with you, Michael, since you, you had uh, very strong feelings on the uh, organizations, they'll say like that, that aren't specialists. Yeah, like they hand you this big playbook and it's all well and good and you know, I need to install patch X, Y, and Z and I get it and here's the value to the IT system, but where's the value to the business? I, I, my role, even though I manage OT, is to really unearth the value for our company. Where's the value to our company? Like, you know, that consultant might, it's important to me to partner with somebody that understands our, the, the business side because, you know, it would be like analytically having a data scientist that knows nothing about the business that you're, you're rolling into. You're, you're going to ask more questions that need to be answered. That's why it's important for me to partner with somebody that understands what the oil and gas footprint looks like, what assets are most important to business continuity that have the biggest risk or you know, could have the biggest impact if they were attacked, and prioritize it a little bit like that. So again, I have many funnels um, or, or you know, sieves that I put this through. Like, to me, it's important to have somebody to help me provide that mesh of what should I really be worried about and focusing on for my business vertical. If you're in manufacturing, it's gonna be maybe a little bit different than mine, although we do just manufacture carbon atoms, that's what natural gas is all about. <laughs> So like each business vertical or, or each business or enterprise is going to have their own set of priorities based off of what they do, or they should anyway, in my view. Mm -hmm. And John, how do you approach assessments? Yeah, so it's a challenge, right? It's, uh, they're expensive, they're a snapshot in time, but, they, but, but it is, they are helpful, right? They, they give you some information that hopefully you, you didn't know about. If you know about it, fix it first, right? Don't, don't, <laughs> if you know you need to patch, you know you need to uh, upgrade systems, do that first right. because that's going to show up in their report, right? Why waste the time and the money on that? Um, but when you get the information, what's critical is, well, I think I heard it, making sure they understand your business and your industry, making sure they understand how your infrastructure is set up. There may be some mitigating controls that are in place that, that help protect you. you know, the, the other layers there, there's fire, you know, it's behind firewalls or whatever it may be. If they just come out and say your system's, you know, um, exposed and, and uh, you know, able to be hacked, well, they didn't look deep enough to see that, you know, there's some layers in there that can protect us. So if those show up on a report, all of a sudden everybody, everyone's scrambling to, to try to, um, you know, uh, <laughs> recover from that and explain that. Um, so um, I, I think they're a challenge, but I think they're necessary, right? Mm -hmm. Somebody has to come in, third party, to, to kind of pull back the layers and the covers and say, look, here's some problems, and, and then you can um, justify um, somewhat, um, you know, some funding to get mm -hmm. some things done and, uh, and or resources you may need mm -hmm. to, to help you do that. So um, necessary evil, I guess. Yeah. And we've, we've talked a couple times about patching and convergence and some of the other stuff, and. Uh, you know, anecdotally, we always hear the stories of, right, you know, IT will come down with uh, a policy and then OT will hear it and after they stop laughing, they, <laughs> they never enact it. Uh, patching is probably the easiest one, the other is probably USBs, right, we're going to ban USBs, right? Uh, I'm going on my 20th year of hearing we're banning US, USBs, so, uh, but that being said, uh, how do you guys overcome that hurdle of the kind of the disconnect between the fact that traditionally security is owned by IT that has a different kind of priority? 
versus the OT you know, who, who sees IT, uh, security typically as a roadblock to them accomplishing their goals. How do you guys overcome those challenges? And Jeff, I'll, I'll leave with you on this one. I mean, fortunately, there's a lot of fear throughout the, throughout the world right now, you know, among this issue. So I think that's, that's driving a cultural change on its own. I mean, I think the, the incidents you've heard of, of uh, you know, water infrastructure, mm -hmm. you know, being seriously threatened, um, mm -hmm. you know, have driven a lot of change in, in the mindset of, of maybe some of the organizational leaders in the past that mm -hmm. were opposed to making sure they, you know, they have everything buttoned up on the IT mm -hmm. side. Um, you know, so I mean that that's been the the biggest driving factor that has assisted and, and made it much easier to to convince people that they need to be doing this regularly. Mm. And Michael, how do you you kind of you kind of have a unique role in the fact that you kind of bridge both gaps more than most? Yeah. So to me, I'm all about value and profit. Mm -hmm. Like that's without that, there is no need for cybersecurity. So. I look at that as being, let's figure out what we need to do and then let's figure out how we secure it. And um, let's make sure that we not only have an initial design consultation with our cybersecurity team on you know, best practices, making sure it falls in line, but I think most importantly, let's have a post-mortem uh, on that same project because oftentimes projects land you know, from a network or other perspective in a little bit different place and maybe some risks I'm not aware of, they can uh, be aware of. Uh, it's definitely part of the culture now, like uh, it's a growing part of the culture I think for every industry and just like uh, end user or, or and worker safety, it's the same thing. Like mm -hmm. to me, those two things are kind of paramount and go hand in hand. Uh, because in instances, especially in my vertical, if somebody you know, allows a bad actor in, it could mean life or death for people. And, mm -hmm. and that's important. We're not just talking about loss of revenue. Um, that's significantly important to us. So to me, it's that marriage, and, and that's how we're really driving things through our already stable culture of uh, safety. Yeah, and I think that's I think it's an important aspect when we look at uh, the operational side of the house, right? Is I do truly believe it's a safety component above everything else, right? If you if you look at the way, uh, I, and specifically look at the the energy sector, right? World changed after uh, an explosion in Texas City about 20 years ago. To this day, oil and gas still talks about this explosion, how it changed all regulations, and how safety became, uh, you know, the priority for a lot of organizations. Are we, are we starting to get closer to where something similar from a cyber incident might be happening? Uh, Gartner as recently as uh, uh, I think three months ago released that they believe there'll be fatalities around OT cyber in the next five years. Uh, how do you guys approach that? What are y'all's thoughts on kind of that? Uh, I'll start with you, Michael. It's scary, you know, the term. Anytime somebody uses the word weaponize <laughs> in relation to cybersecurity or energy, like it's, it makes your ears perk up and then not only the liability associated with that, but the responsibility, and a lot of that responsibility will fall on CEOs um, for not protecting their employees and or their communities, right? Mm -hmm. So once those things start to happen, like, and, you know, we start to head in that direction, it no longer becomes a public embarrassment of data getting breached or passwords getting breached, or I found your AOL password on you know the dark web or the digital uh, underworld. You know, it's now it's somebody's family is not going to have you to come home. You know, you're not going to be able to come home because you were killed in a natural gas explosion at a gas processing facility. Mm -hmm. Now it's life or death. You know, so. You know, we wear that very heavily. It's a weighted vest around us. It's something we have to think for. But <clears throat> more importantly, I think it's something that you can't just spring up in 2025. I think that report was for this is yeah. going to happen around 2025. You can't just spring up in 2025 and say, OK, I need cybersecurity. <laughs> it's like your roadmap should have started years ago in getting to the point where that risk will be mitigated for you by 2025. It's like we're net carbon negative when every other company says, hey, we're going to be carbon neutral by 2040. <laughs> like, you have to be here sooner than later, yep. you know? And you, that's why you need to realize time to value, mm -hmm. you know, and you need to speed through these things. John, I, I'd love to hear your, because you, your, your approach, you came from the chemical and now you're in, yeah. you're in steel. And so I think 
both very, you know, from a safety component, is very, I think, conscious and at risk constantly for this. How do you guys approach Absolutely. cyber with safety? Yeah, yeah. So, so um, uh, our, uh, I guess, tagline is it, it's it's is you know, security and safety are are, are the same, right? So, um, even our CEO um, has has gone out and said, you know, cyber is is important. Um, our, what really alarms me is when I talk to some of the plant managers and we talk about just something as simple as taking down a firewall to upgrade it. If we don't do it right, it could um, release some chemical. Um, that, that's scary to me. That, even, even our own people can cause that kind of a problem. Um, so we have to be very careful. So if we can do it, and somebody gets inside of our system, um, you know, um, bad things could happen. So making sure that the proper procedures, you know, almost like a cyber lockout tagout kind mm -hmm. of process to make sure that you don't do anything before uh, the right things are shut down before mm -hmm. you make any changes. Um, in the chemical industry, that's what we, what we started doing is making sure that we were, um, you know, not affecting the plant in that way to cause a kind of a problem. Yeah, that, yeah. The, the plug uh, white paper we did, we actually had a chemical company talking about avoiding helicopter moments. He mm. says, uh, as an operational lead, he always wanted to focus on anything that prevented a newscopter from circling one of his plants. Mm. That's you know, he really wanted to focus on using cyber the same way he does anything else because that's his biggest nightmare is he doesn't want helicopters circling one of their chemical plants. And I think when we see the seriousness of cyber and OT, it gets taken a little bit different dynamic for us. Uh, as we go through this, and I've, I've started thinking quite a bit, I started off this with the guys that tell you no. And, I, and it's funny I said that because at the end of the day, I'm one of the big believers that we're at our best when we're not seen as disablers, but enablers. Uh, how do you guys approach that, enabling different things within the, your organization from a cybersecurity perspective? And Jeff, uh, I'll leave you off with the, the first test. What, what are some of the things you guys do to enable rather than disable? Oh, I I mean, I think we need to make sure we're putting the right technology in the hands of our people. I mean, first of all, so, I, you know, I think from the, you know, beginning with the, the leaders of the company, you know, we all need to be aligned. Our vision must be aligned in, in where, we're, where we're headed. I mean, I think we're experiencing the same types of challenges Michael described, the oil and gas industry, and, and we're, a, we're a part of that, you know, I think are going through a rapid, rapid transformation, uh, you know, certainly. You know, our company's only been in existence for 10 years. So, mm -hmm. you know, I think, as you can imagine, when you went from zero to where we are in, in 10 years, um, you know, I think the industry's going through a similar transformation in terms of adoption of, of technology and use of automation. And, and you know, all of that comes along with making sure you have, you know, a good cyber security plan in place uh, to avoid, you know, some of the instances that, that mm -hmm. Michael described, um, you know, and I think, like I said, everything's dynamic, so mm -hmm. we're setting things up and removing it, you know, at all sorts of places. So, you know, I think, it, like I said, it's, it begins from the top of the organization. You know, we need to make sure we have a vision. That vision is communicated. Our, our workforce is bought in. And then we need to be able to be making the investment to facilitate that vision. And we need to be making the investment in the right equipment, the right hardware, the right software, um, you know, and the right, right solutions to mm -hmm. be able to facilitate that for our employees, yep. for Michael. our workforce, so that, so that they do come home safely <laughs> and, and we're all protected. Absolutely. Michael, your thoughts? Yeah, so it's a pendulum, right? So it's like enablement, access, restriction, cybersecurity, and it usually kind of swings over time. Sorry to the sound people. <laughs> um, so when I first got into the organization, we started to digitally transform. Our data was locked up like tighter than Hannibal Lecter in the movie Silence of the Lambs. Like it would escape every now and again, and like it, I think it eventually ended up in Cancun with a horrible sequel. But like for the most part, it's also shot in Pittsburgh. Just in case you didn't know, people <laughs> online. Um, so I think that we've swung to the side of access with security, with a sidecar of security. I think that's come now coming back through to the middle where it's equal partners. And I think it'll probably stay there because you know, to stay competitive in today's market, you have to have profit, you have to enable, you have to have business value, but you have to do it securely for you know, risk. You identify the risk. You know, for me, it's enablement first with an extreme fast follow of overt security. So it's part of our internal design process to make sure it's secure. 
So I think that creates a synergy between both the cybersecurity team, the end users, or the people who realize the value, and my team, which is like literally right in the middle. Mm -hmm. um, so I think that's important to us. But I think it always goes back and forth. And I think you know, for a while we were, you know, all data, all access. And I think it's swinging back through that that fulcrum point in the center. John, how do you how do you look at enabling from a security perspective? Yeah, so I, I learned early on in my career um, when I first got my first management position in uh, in cybersecurity, I was replacing a guy who was known as the no guy, and it's not because he knew everything, it's because he said no to everything. <laughs> I think uh, people would get two words out of their mouth and his answer was no. So it took two years to kind of uh, rebuild that relationship with the business and, and people to help them understand that I'm here to help enable. How can we do it securely? It may end up being a no, but most chances are we can do that some way securely. So um, ever since then, I always made it an effort um, to go out to the plants and kind of see, you know, I could sit in an office and write a policy, no USBs. Well, that, that's not realistic, right? <laughs> and so getting out to the plants and understanding what they, you know, what, what they need to function, um, USBs, or how do they get data from this system to that system, or how do they connect this system to that system. Um, understanding that helps help give me a perspective on being able to write the right policies that enable them, or putting in the layers of security to help them do what they need to do, as opposed to being the no guy. Perfect. Yeah, it's almost like in the, in, in the project charter, you need to include, you know, how to securely architect your network for that to be enabled to like their time and their money or consultants' time and money to be able to help you with those things mm -hmm. is needed in the project because then you get a clear picture of like, what's happening with the data, what's happening with the application, but also like a fuller picture of what needs to happen on the back end so that you know now the business is engaged on everything that goes on behind the scenes and are kind of aware of your value as a cybersecurity office. And when, and when, we, when we start looking at this, and you mentioned risk earlier, and I think that's uh, a pretty important concept when we look at it. It's not just uh, risk avoidance, it's also risk acceptance, right? You want the data to make sure, am I, am I, is this an acceptable risk or not? How do you guys approach Kind of a risk measurement, uh, and, I'll, and I'll I'll start with you, Jeff. I get to lead them all off. <laughs> um, I mean, I think for us, I mean, we're we're looking at the PNL. I mean, I think we're mm -hmm. we're like Michael said. I mean, I think we're in, we need to make sure that you know we can continue to generate operating profits, and the investment is going to generate the ROI that we expect it to. Um, a lot of a lot of this is driven by you know customer re requirements, certainly. Mm -hmm. um, you know, and, and kind of just making sure that we're going to continue to operate effectively. I mean, how do you approach we, it? we don't have a specific process defined around that risk assessment, um, mm -hmm. you know, but, you know, I think, like I said earlier, it's about well, making good judgment um, mm -hmm. and, and using business sense in, in making, making these decisions. Yeah, and I think that's one of the interesting concepts, right, is that uh, a lot of times we want to make a decision without knowing what the inherent risks are. Yeah. So I think the, it all starts with that good data. Do I have good data to make the decision? Do I yeah. understand where the risks are? Uh, so when we start thinking about it from that perspective, how would you approach it, Michael? We do. We use a, a risk registry or risk matrix approach um, so that people that get paid a lot more money than I do can look at the holistic impact of the company and identify mm -hmm. maybe things that I've missed. So they can either reprioritize or say, that's not even a risk at all. Let's remove that from the risk registry. And that provides us with a nice roadmap of the things that we need to attack over time. It really just outlines your, and, and once you get the operational people to sit down with the IT people, the OT people, and your executive management, then that creates a more holistic thought and provides an easier access to things like resource Forces in time, mm -hmm. you know, because it's the operations people, they're the people that, you know, you're going to have changes to your environment, they're going to be the ones that experience the symptoms, you know, they're going to need the Maalox because now they have to have, you know, two accounts to access this or multi-factor authentication, you have, they have to jump through this hoop for that, mm -hmm. so they need to be part of it because it's going to, chances are it's going to change their process and they're going to be the people that, you know, have negative consequences. They need to understand why. Just like we need to understand what the value of the technology they want us to implement, or you know, things like that. Mm -hmm. And and John, as you guys approach kind of the the maturity of cybersecurity and OT, because I think that I, I I always make the statement we're at least 15 years behind kind of IT from hygiene and best practices mm -hmm. and standards. How do, what are the changes you've seen over you know from a maturity standpoint in OT cyber over the last decade? 
Uh, I think the key is visibility, um, visibility into the, 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 uh, the systems, the data, um, and bringing that visibility to the right people at the plant. Right? I talked about the scorecards, right? um, uh, helping, helping those folks understand these systems are at risk. Um, and, and then also, you know, giving the visibility to the operators to see, um, you know, what's happening on the floor from, uh, you know, uh, ones and zeros, mm -hmm. well, who's, what's, what's talking to what and why. Um, and then helping them understand if there's vulnerabilities there that could impact them. It could, mm -hmm. you know, cause an unscheduled shutdown um, from a cyber event, which we don't want to happen. So <laughs> at least give them the vis visibility, they can make a decision, is a risk going to take or not. Um, again, they could put layers of security in there to help protect that or accept the risk. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and over the last decade, what are the, some of the things you've seen, Michael, from a OT cybersecurity standpoint, from a maturity standpoint? Well, technology that we use has matured, right? So, mm -hmm. you know, we're now, we're now off-prem, we're now cloud, you know, we're now IoT, MQTT, all the Ts. I'm an OTOG. <laughs> I'm just going to wrap now. But, you know, like that has evolved significantly over time to the point where you know, we had to catch up to use the technology. Now we have to catch up even more to secure the technology. That has shifted significantly. Uh, the role it plays on our day-to-day -day activities is much more significant. Um, so those two things are like paramount to me. Like not only are the bad actors getting ahead of us, but the technology is moving at such a rapid pace that we have to think past the technology there today and what's on the second and third horizon and what type of skill set of people do I need to bring into my enterprise to correctly secure this stuff. Um, it's just a lot. Mm -hmm. And when we start thinking about protection, and I think one of the, if you follow any kind of surveys when it comes to OT security, they, they always say the, the thing we should most worry about are the devices that can't protect themselves. Uh, I always list it off as the, the three letter acronyms, right? Our RTUs, our PLCs, our MTUs, our VFDs, right? Yeah, all, all those devices. What are the ways you approach securing those devices? And I'll le let you lead with this one, Michael. So <laughs> they have a code on them, right? So. Mm -hmm monitoring the code, having like following the NIST 5 for those devices, which typically the NIST 5 is not generally thought of for PLC HMIs. We're talking about network topology, we're talking about your enterprise architecture. We rely on those things greatly. And, and now you're introducing things like edge computing and cloud computing and all of those things expand you know, the, the threat matrix or the, the, the threat surface. Mm -hmm. uh, so, you know, you have to look at a very low degree. That's why you have to be in with the operations folks mm -hmm. uh, to everyone's point and understand what's most valuable to them. What kind of fail safes do you have in place? What kind of physical security do you have around those things? Uh, which is not always thought of or not always transparent on any enterprise or any business vertical I've seen. Sometimes people forget about the physical aspect of things. You have to apply the NIST 5 all the way down to that level. Uh, you have to see into that level. You have to know when there's a change in that level. You know, mm -hmm. uh, that's important, especially by 2025, if we're going to weaponize things. There's a <laughs> lot of changes that need to be made on a PLC uh, or an HMI for that component to be weaponized, then bypass the physical security of mm -hmm. that device, et cetera. So situational awareness, you got to raise it. Absolutely agree. Uh, John, how do you approach kind of those low level, you know, I call them the easy targets, I guess, we, the, the dumb computing devices? Yeah, uh, again, layers of security around it. Um, so, you know, the segmentation, the, um, you know, additional layers uh, above and, and beyond that. Uh, also making sure that the, you know, OT folks, uh, again, have visibility into that inventory where that is so we can, mm -hmm. so we can protect it. And, and then, you know, just, just a matter of uh, you know, situational awareness, making, making everyone aware of what's there so we can secure it. Yeah, I think a lot of times when we talk about OT security, we kind of, we talk about the disadvantages a lot, mm. but I think we ignore that there's a, there's a couple big advantages in OT. One, we typically have very static environments. You know, I don't have that in IT, right? I got DHCP, I've got all this, these changing things, I got BYOD, you know, uh, you got, now you got me speaking in acronyms, but- uh, <laughs> You're gonna rap? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> well, I was gonna try to find a joke for OPP, but I just couldn't figure a way to fit that in. But, uh, but no, when you, when you really look at it, right, when we start talking about, you know, the, the disadvantages, we, we always forget that 
one of the big advantages is we are static. Our, we can take a baseline. I know what normal is in my environment. Mm -hmm. Now alert me to abnormal. Mm -hmm. You know, when we start looking at that kind of paradigm shift, I, I think a lot of times we overlook that the value of that that static nature, right? I, if it's working, it's operating under good spec. Great. Something changes. I should be alerted to that. Okay. So when we look at alerting and visibility, what are the components you guys think are the highest value? Is it just knowing what's talking to what? Is it knowing what versions do I have on on my devices? Uh, or is it something I'm not even thinking about? You know, uh, and I'll let you lead again, Michael. So I don't pick on Jack. I, I, you know, you you have to understand from your baseline example, you know, what's normal, uh, where that traffic goes to. You have to have a clear network, topology, I always get that word wrong, uh, <laughs> of your OT network to understand that, hey, you know, I see the most usage between point A and point B, uh, point C, D, and E also feed into that from times, oh, look, I, I have unusual activity there. Um, you have to be able to see down to that level. You have to also know when somebody's snooping around, mm -hmm. to be quite honest with you, and I think that can hide in regular traffic. Mm -hmm. You know, um, I think that uh, I'm not gonna sit and look at that traffic 24 seven. I'm not gonna packet sniff myself uh, <laughs> and get out Wireshark or whatever other tool that these kids are using these days. Um, but you have to uh, have an awareness and understanding of uh, what that affects mm -hmm. um, and what that can mean for your enterprise and your company. And then you have to be able to, to sift through those things uh, and get, you know, notified when something is abnormal. So, you know, we've moved from uh, on the analytics side from prescriptive to predictive. You know, mm -hmm. I, I think that now we're just on cybersecurity side touching prescriptive. Uh, Perspective, mm -hmm. not perspective, prescriptive. Prescriptive. <laughs> and we're then going to be, from there, we'll be able to talk about, you know, uh, anything more forward looking from there. But we're just touching that now. Do you agree? No, absolutely agree. Uh, so I got the, the, the time starting to wrap up, so I kind of leave everyone with final thoughts. Uh, Jeff, anything you would like everyone to take away? I think. Um, in, I think one of the biggest benefits for us, I think, in terms of, of cyber has been the implementation of, of you know, tempered air walls or hip switches, um, you know, as a, as a cloaking device, as an encryption device. I think that's, that's something that's given us a lot of comfort, um, you know, I think, but we, we need to stay on top of it because, you know, I think, like I described, we're, we're continuing to introduce new components to our, our control system, um, you know, so I think, you know, we just, need to make sure that it's a it's a constant vigilance um, you know and we're we have a program designed to mm -hmm. to effectuate that perfect michael yeah the human firewall was <laughs> most important you know put it in their performance plans um, you know to me don't leave out your contract base that access your systems every day you're training your employees but are you also training your contractors as well in terms of what's expected from them is that part of your msa um, you know, from a supply chain standpoint, um, those two items, you're not as secure as you think you are. Um, and what are you going to do about it? John, uh, best for last. Yeah, oh, thanks. Uh, hit hit two, two keynotes here. One, for the IT folks, uh, you can't push your IT controls down on OT, you'll break something. So reach out to those folks and have a conversation. Uh, for the OT folks, um, if you haven't uh, secured and protected your systems yet, uh, you need to. It's coming, so you need to be prepared. So again, convergence of IT and OT is important to make sure those communications are happening and help protect your business. Okay, well, I thank everybody for your time today. I really appreciate it. Uh, I think we've got quite a few more things to go, and uh, thanks, everybody. Appreciate it. Yeah. Thank you. Thanks, guys.